to get my good angle. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, you know, and I, I don't know if it's true or not, but yeah, they say that people are getting Botox now <laughs> because they're, because they're all they're seeing their themselves so in this little <laughs> box on their Zoom or whatever. <laughs> And I'm like, oh, I'm not that vain. <laughs> Maybe in a few years I will be. <laughs> um, okay, so can you tell me a little about yourself, how you identify, what your pronouns are, who you are, what you do at CAP, all, all of that? Yeah, so I'm David Kirk. I come from the Stalo people, which is uh, out in the Fraser Valley. I come from the Chiacto uh, community. And um, I identify as two-spirited. And I use the pronouns he, him, and his. And I've been with the university. This is my 14th year going. It's going into my 15th year now. Wow. So I am the Indigenous faculty advisor, as well as I teach a few courses. So I've taught the queer studies course, for example. I'm currently teaching uh, reconciliation in action. It's a third year interdisciplinary mm -hmm course I'm co-teaching that with uh, Derek Murray and I teach in our bridging program which is University One for Indigenous Aboriginal Learners which is a bridging program. Oh that's so cool. Look at you. Um, all right so what does pride look like to you? Pride is something that it took a long time for me to um, really appreciate growing up. I grew up in the 60s so I was uh, faced with being bullied, called, called uh, lots of derogatory terms. Um, so it was something that I wasn't really proud of. Uh, I, I knew from an early age that I was gay or two-spirited, um, but it was something that I had a hard time accepting because of all the stigma and the shame. Um, so as I've grown older uh, and starting to recognize uh, where we've come as queer people in, in particular in Canada and the advancements we've made, um, it's made me realize that we need to be proud of who we are. And I think of some of those early years in the 80s going to the pride parade, they're nothing like what they are today. It was really a grass move, grassroots movement. Yeah. Um, and you could possibly face, you know, some stigma because there wasn't that many people. It's not like today where you get five or 600,000, not, not now because of COVID, but, <laughs> yeah. but you would get, you know, five, 600,000 spectators. Uh, it wasn't like that in the, you know, and I think of, I think of the, those that fought for our rights long before, e even before I came along. Um, I have some really good friends who are, who've since passed away, but they were my mentors for many, many years. They were a gay couple. They were both retired teachers in the 50s and 60s. And that was at a time that they couldn't be open at work. They led completely different lives at work and they were a couple, they were together for 42 years, but they hid their relationship from their workplace being teachers. Only a close circle of of uh, their friends knew who they were and, and that they were gay and that they were a couple. So they were my mentors for, about, well, I guess about 20 years. Sadly, they've now been gone for about 15 years. But so those and those teachings that they shared me really instilled um, what pride means. That was a long answer, sorry. No, I love <laughs> it. That was a fantastic answer. Please feel free to take as much time as you want. Um, can you tell me about a situation when you felt most proud to be queer? Probably um, at my time starting at CAP. I have been always pretty open, at, you know, in my adult life of, of identifying as two-spirited mm -hmm. and being able to be a resource for the CAP U uh, queer resource room has always been something that's warmed my heart. Because just like I was mentioning the two mentors, I, I've had many mentors in my life, but the, the couple that was together for 42 years, um, you know, being able to be a mentor to those that are just coming out, figuring out their, their sexual identity and who they are. And, you know, we, just like Indigenous people, we need to see more Indigenous people in front of the classroom. We need to see more queer teachers in front of the classroom and to be open. Because we are, you know, I don't know what our what the current stats are, 10% of the population. 
You know, at one time I, I spent uh, about 30 years living in the West End because that was a safe place to live. You could walk down the street and for the most part, not worry about uh, being yelled at or beaten up or whatever, although it does happen and it's happened, you know, up until, you know, last summer. Uh, but now what we're, what's amazing we see is our community is living in all parts of the lower mainland and all parts of Canada. And we're, uh, that's something you, you didn't see back in the 50s, 60s and 70s. You lived in the gay ghetto. I mean, the, the West End was the gay ghetto. It was a great, it was a great ghetto. <laughs> uh, but there was also a division between gay men and lesbian and women who identified as lesbians because they tended to live up on Commercial Drive. So that was kind of their neighborhood. <laughs> we had our neighborhood in the West End. That part of that is this whole concept that uh, even within our community, men still get paid more. There's that, there was that pay inequity. Sorry, I'm, I'm kind of digressing to a different story. No, but no, the, the pride is, is being able to uh, be open and to mentor uh, students who identify as part of the queer community at CAP because it's really like you see that light bulb go off and go oh it's okay I'm at a safe place um, but I because I know students don't always feel safe uh, in the classroom so it's just having that wow I've, have I made a difference in somebody's life like those that came before me that impacted my life I can definitely confirm that you have always been such a strong presence in the queer collective. Like we always, it was always like, anytime students would come in and be like, oh, like I have a class with like David Kirk. Has anybody like heard about him? We were all like, oh, you're gonna be fine. Don't even worry, you're good. Um, and like when you came in for our like queer elder, like little like chats, it was always so much fun. You always, oh, it was always great. I miss being in the queer collective and like being in that like room and that like cozy space, all of us together. We just got a brand new room, furnished it all up, and then we haven't used it. We to COVID. It's ridiculous. I was up in the new room once before before COVID. I know. I had, but we'll I, be back there. We'll we, be will. Back we, there. we will. We um, will. One day. Yeah, it's really about. Yeah, it's really about supporting each other and for those that are a little bit older like myself uh if i can make a difference in uh, somebody's life somebody's journey to kind of go yeah you might face some challenges but um you'll get there yeah oh that was a great answer <laughs> um so what advice would you give to a queer first year student coming to cap and starting university for the first time a couple things. The first thing is I would, which is what I did as an undergrad student at UBC, and this was back a few decades ago, <laughs> um, was I got involved with the queer collective at UBC. I mean, I'd been open and out and hanging out in gay bars for many years prior to, because I was a mature student going back to school, but UBC was still an, an intimidating place. Yeah. Um, so it was like, okay, the, so the two places for me that I would hang out at UBC was the First Nations House of Learning, which is the longhouse that is open to, what's well, open to anybody, but it's specific for Indigenous students, but also uh, I, I got actively involved in the, the queer collective at UBC. To the point, my first year, <laughs> I agreed to host uh, a house party. And I thought, oh, that'll just be a few, a few people come over. Uh, I think about 50 or 60 people showed up at my apartment. I oh. did get put on notice for the manager of the building. <laughs> and I didn't do, you know, people do that as kids. I, I, I in high school, um, I didn't have that many friends. As I mentioned before, I was, I was often bullied in junior high and high school. So uh, it was kind of like doing what you do in high school. You know, you have that house party. Yeah. It didn't get out of control. Things didn't get damaged or anything, but we did make a lot of noise. But yeah, get involved. <laughs> get involved with uh, the Queer Collective at CAP. Get involved with social activities with the CSU. Our Indigenous Student Center is open to all students. It's a great safe place uh, for all students to come and hang out. You know, we, I've been at, this is my 15th year at the university and I have probably had probably five or six student, indigenous students who have been in one stage of uh, transitioning 
in their gender. And it's, you know, I have to say it's never been an issue. We've never had um, problems within the center. Now that's not to say those students haven't had issues in their classroom with uh, other students, but it's our, our center and the just like the queer uh, resource center are safe places to hang out. You can be yourself, come to our center, I'll tease you, but in a good way. Um, so kind of bouncing off of that, what is something you think CAP could do better to support its queer community? I think uh, more visibility um, around, we've just recently started participating at the uh, North Vancouver Pride event, which uh, of course this year happened online because of COVID. But yeah. that's only been something recent the university has started. The president's office has uh, just started um, the president's queer advisory group. That's probably not the official name of the group. <laughs> I'm on it. Lori, Lori's on it from the CSU. Yeah. Uh, so we're starting to look at how we need to be doing things differently for our uh, for our queer people who are on campus. So much more uh, more visible, more support. Um, and I'm not saying that CAP is in a safe place to be, but it's still one of those things. You know, you kind of watch your back a little bit when you're in a classroom, you don't know the instructor, those types of things. Yeah. So we just need to, uh, we need to be celebrated more on campus. Yeah. I think that's a good way to put it. Yeah, I would definitely agree. I Yeah. CSU has been always great. There's always posting events, queer events, just fun events, dog therapy days, which is right next to our center. <laughs> oh, great. Who's Look who is going to come and have a visit, maybe. <gasps> who is this? Oh, hello. <laughs> this is one of my cats. That's Lord Prancer. <laughs> you can put him in the video. That's fine. He is, uh, I have two cats, one 13 and one, oh. he's just two years old. So my partner, I had two cats originally, and sadly, one of them passed away a few years ago. Oh. And her sister was really, really lonely. So we thought... We waited a year and we thought, do we, do we get another cat to keep her company? <laughs> we thought, well, let's get a kitten because, you know, kittens are wonderful. Well, he drove her nuts the first month. <laughs> he was like, what have you done to me? <laughs> but after about a month, they started warming up to each other. And they, you know, so he's two now. And so they bathe each other and they'll, they'll be cuddled up on the sofa or the bed together. So they're, they're really close friends. And she's not as, she, that one year that she was alone, she was, you could tell she was really lonely. He's a, he's a little brat. He, in, in the middle of teaching or I'm working on something, he'll come and plop himself down on my laptop. <laughs> I'm like, get off, I have, I have to teach. <laughs> Um, well, you mentioned some of the queer events that we run. What would you say is your favorite CSU queer event that we've run ever? Oh, there's so many, but I think we need to be doing more social events off campus. So things like yes. bowling. <laughs> bowling! <laughs> That's a fun you can have for those that, you know, want to have a beer or have a soft drink or whatever. That's really it's one of those things that people don't take too seriously. <laughs> I grew up bowling, so it's kind of like, yeah, so it's having things, it's important to have things on campus, mm -hmm. but it's important, I think, to do things within the community. So for example, I, I uh, it, it hasn't run for a year or two, but we uh, we run the Queer Studies, it's a liberal, course, liberal mm -hmm. studies course, but we've actually, I think we just recently moved it into winter, women's and gender studies. Oh, that makes sense. Um, but one of the things we did with the with that class one year was they have the very gay walking tour of Vancouver. Yes, I've heard and very good. It is amazing. Glenn is the fellow that leads that. I can't remember Glenn's last name. Mm -hmm. uh, you do it's about a two hour walk through the city, and he gives you all this history. And I'm like, man, I've lived here my whole life, and there's some things I'm even learning. <laughs> Oh. Yeah, so doing more more off-campus socializing. And that's not to say it has to be a bar or anything like that, because yeah. I find bars are not the greatest place to, yeah. to socialize anyways. But doing activities, going, you know, um, within the, the queer community, they, they've, oh, what's it called now? I think it's Out and About. Yeah, it's Out and About. A social group that you go out and do hikes, 
or you yeah. go on a kayaking together, you do kind of outdoor stuff. I think those things uh, are better to be able to communicate and you're not trying to talk over loud music in a nightclub. Although I don't even know if nightclubs are open during the COVID. Yeah, I don't think so. But don't think one so. day. They might be. I, I've thrown past the stage of going to bars and nightclubs a few yeah, I... decades ago. <laughs> And I used to laugh, my friends that, that I mentioned earlier that were my mentors, I was 20 something and I was still going out dancing on Friday and Saturday nights. And I'd be like, <laughs> oh, come on, you guys, you're not that old. <laughs> I'm now their age. <laughs> By 11 o'clock, I'm going to bed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can't wait for things to start opening up again so that we can, I mean, like even just like going to like drag shows at like Junction and like stuff like that, like just like, seeing the queer community and like outside of just like the few people you interact with on like a daily basis it's I miss it so much well if if uh those that are watching this video interview if they're on Facebook a really good group is Vancouver Gay History oh it's a great page to follow nice. they post that why I was thinking about that you mentioned drag shows um they've recently posted pictures one of the original bars in Vancouver was called BJ's yeah and it was a drag bar and it was uh i don't know what the year it was opened in the late 60s early 70s and it was it was around until the 80s and then the building burnt down down on pender street um but yeah so though this if you're if you're looking for the gay history of vancouver it's 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 a facebook page and people are posting pictures of or videos from past parades or events and when you, it just brought up the memory of BJ's when he said drag club, because somebody recently posted a bunch of pictures of BJ's when it was in its heyday. Oh, that's so fun. I yeah. was just talking in my last interview about how I am a sucker for queer history. I love it so much. I just yeah, so if you, when you, when you're done school, <laughs> take uh, the very gay Vancouver walking tour. Uh, Glenn has a wealth of information about and we started off down by um, Vancouver Center and then kind of winded and worked our way up into the West End. But he shares all these key things that have happened throughout the, oh, the history so of the last fifty years. And I'm like, I didn't know that. <laughs> I wish I had taken notes now though, because it's like, because there was so much good information. <laughs> um, okay, and then my last question, just because we are running out of time, because. I do not own the fancy Zoom, so I can only do 40 minute recordings at a time. Um, is do you have any parting advice you would want to give to the queer community in general right now? Be kind to one another, support one another, um, and reach out to somebody. And especially during these times of COVID, I mean, we will get through this, but I know, you know, if you're, uh, you know, if you're somebody who identifies as part of the queer community and you're, and you're single, that means your, you know, your social network has gone to nothing other than meeting your friends on Zoom, or maybe you have a couple of people that are in your, your bubble, but it's really reaching out and making sure that um, your friends or whoever is are safe and that they're being supported and make friends. Yeah. You know, and make friends. We do have allies that are that are non-queer. <laughs> <laughs> One of my closest friends I've known for 33 years. Um, he's straight, but he's like my he's like my best friend when we hang out and he's uh -huh. going to gay bars with me back in the day when <laughs> I was going to bars. But he's yeah, so we do have allies that support us. Um, but yeah, make friends, reach out, stay in touch with people yeah um, and you know uh, as the elders always share is never you know never take the day for granted enjoy and cherish each day that comes along yeah awesome well thank you so much i very much appreciate you sitting down and chatting with me and yeah thank you well thank you very much good luck with the rest